Uh, hi class, this is Professor Smith. I'll be doing a movie on mean, median, mode comparisons. In this example, we have a flight, 4581, that's traveling from Pittsburgh to San Antonio. The flight is due to into San Antonio at 507, and the following list gives the flight 4581 arrival times relative to the 507 p.m. in minutes for a selection of 18 days. A negative number means the flight arrived earlier. So in this data, we are asked in part A, for these data, which measures of central tendency take more than one value? So let's first talk about the mean and the median. The mean and the median will always exist for data. So why is it that the mean and the median always exist? Well, if you think back to how we find the mean, we add up all the data values and divide by two. So we can all, not divide by two, <laughs> and we divide by the number of data values. And the median is the middle number. So if we have data, we can find the middle number and we can also find the mean. So the question then becomes, when we look at this, it says, which measures of central tendency take on more than one value? There's really only one that can take on more than one value, and that's the mode. So it has the possibility of taking on more than one value. Another thing I should mention about the mean and median, what if um, your teacher said, you know, the average for the last test was 78, and then you come back, to class and they hand back the exams and they say, the mean for the test was 85. And you're thinking, oh, wait a moment. You said last week that it was 78 and this week it's 85. That would be kind of fishy. So it's unique. The mean for a particular data set is unique. They tell you that the average salary for people that are graduating with a certain major is 47,000. And then when you get the job, and they tell you that the mean is 47,000 and you get the job and they say, oh, the mean was 36,000, that would be a problem. So we want for a particular data set, we want that mean to be unique. And so it is with the median as well. So it is unique. There is a value that exists and there's not more than one. However, the mode, that's not the case. So let's take a look at our data set and determine if indeed we have some values that occur more than once. So we have two negative ones but we have one, two, one, two, three, four, four fours. And since they've already got the data sorted from smallest to largest, we know here that we do have one mode. But let's say that the five occurred four times. That would be a case where we would have two modes, one that's a four and one that's also a five. In our particular case, we only have one mode. So it says here, for these data, which measures take more than one value. So we know we're never going to answer mean and median. That's taken off the table. The only candidate for a central a measure of central tendency would be the mode. And so since the mode only has one value, then the answer is none of these. None of them take on more than one value because the mean and median never can have that occur. Mode's the only possibility. And for this data set, the mode only has one value. All right, let's go on to part B. Suppose that the measure 37, which is the largest measurement in the data set, were replaced by 69. Which measures of central tendency would be affected by the change? So let's go ahead and erase what we had earlier. So now we're going to replace that 37 with the 69. And the question then becomes, which measure of central tendency would be impacted? So the four, that is the mode, it stays the same. Whether you replace that 69 with the, I mean the 37 with 69 or not. The median, which will be the middle number, it's still got the same number of data values. There's 18 days worth of data. So the median or the middle number for those 18 days is still going to be the same because we replaced. So the candidate, that unless the median was um, the largest data set, then that could be a possible, but I doubt that it could be if it's going to be the middle number. All right, so that's not gonna be the case. All right, 
So then the next thing that's, um, that we say is, hmm, what about the mean? Well, the mean, it turns out, is impacted by change. As a matter of fact, I had my on-ground class. We went around and we asked the question, what's your salary? So since that's really kind of a personal question, I told my students, make up a number, whatever you want. Maybe it's what you hope to earn or whatever. And I, I gave my true salary. And then people just went around and started giving salaries. It was hilarious. So someone said three fifteen. Thousand three hundred fifteen thousand. Another one person said one hundred twenty-five. Another person said fifteen thousand. So we gave these numbers and we added them up and found the average for our group. So for our group, I think the average was like two twenty-five, two hundred twenty-five thousand. And then I said, okay, let's do this, folks. Let's go out and include um, the salary for Beyonce. So they googled Beyonce and got the salary, and I forget what it was, but it was it was pretty. It was amazingly large number. <laughs> I forget what it was. I think it was $8 million, I think, but I could be wrong. Anyway, when we added that value to our smaller numbers, that value, that one value, made a difference in our mean for the class, where the average for the class was, I think, $4 million or $1.4 million. I forget what the data was, but means really impact are impacted by values, whether you replace them or whether you add them on. So it turns out, or remove them off. The mean is what we call resistant. So let's recapture that. The mean, I said is resistant, I meant to say is not resistant. So that means it's impacted by values. So anytime you remove a value and add a larger one, the mean is always going to be impacted. That's a little smiley face. <laughs> Don't laugh at my artistic abilities. So the mean in this particular case is the only one that's impacted when we replace. So let's go out and do the next two questions. We're going to add that second question. So the second question says, suppose that starting with the original data set, the smallest measurement were removed, which measures of central tendency would be changed? So we know anytime you remove something or replace, we know that the mean is going to be impacted. So the mean will be impacted. Then we just have to check to see um, if the med median and mode will be. Well, that four is not going to be impacted because, of course, we're replacing the smallest data set and the four wasn't the smallest. So we only really need to take a look at the median. So originally we had 18 data values. So let's pull up those 18 data values. So now I've pulled up those 18 data values and we are taking away the smallest. And we want to ask, what happens? So before we take away that smallest data value, let's find the median for the original data set. So for the original data set, that 7 wouldn't be eliminated. So let's put it back. Pardon me, that negative 7 wouldn't be eliminated. And since we have 18 data values, that's an even number. So if we take 18 and divide it by 2, we get 9. So we know that it's going to be the halfway between the 9th and 10th data value. So we're going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's going to be halfway between the 4 and the 5. And halfway between 4 and 5, you think of money, what's halfway between 4 bucks and 5 bucks? It's 450. So for the original data set, the median is equal to 4.5. All right, so now let's find it for when we remove the negative 7. So I'm going to remove the negative 7. And now I'm going to find the median for the new data set.
So now instead of having 18 data values, that's going to change now. I don't have 18. So I don't have the 18 now. I have 17. So how do I find it when I have 17 data values? It turns out you're going to take that 17 plus 1 to make it even. And you get 18 over 2, which is 9. So it's going to be the ninth data value. So if you take the ninth data value, and then remember, you're not starting at negative 7 because it's gone. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's the ninth data value. Remember, when it's odd, you really will have a true middle number. Because remember, now we have 17. So if it's the ninth data value, then it's 8 to the right and 8 to the left. So 8 and 8 is 16 plus 1 is 19. So we can see that, oh, the middle number is going to be 5s. So with the new data set, the median is 5. So there is a change, and it depends on the data set. The mean will always be impacted when you remove something. The median could be. And the mode could be, I guess, if the value that was removed was at the bottom of the scale, then if that was the mode, it could change it. So if, without a shadow of a doubt, the mean will always be impacted by the removal of data, just as it was with the replacement of data. The median could be. So, um, and in this particular case, it is. So um, we're going to definitely circle median as well. So you're going to have two checkboxes. For C, you have to check it. Depending on the data set, the median could be left blank or it could be checked. So you have to find the median in both cases. So you have to know how to do it for even data sets and odd data sets. All right, so let's move on to D. D says, which of the following best describes the distribution of the original data set? Negatively skewed, positively skewed, or roughly skewed? So let's go back and look at the original um, data set. So I'm going to add another page and put that original picture back there. So now we have our data in place. And I'm going to use my pen tool to kind of draw a distribution shape that would hit kind of the middle of each of those bars of our histogram. Whenever that tail hovers to the right, that's called positively skewed. Remember that case with the Beyonce? Adding on that one value, even though it's very small, I mean, not very many of them, but that one value is gonna really um, skew the data. And so that's called positively skewed. If our graph had the tail going to the left, so the hump is kind of further to the right, that's called negatively skewed. I don't know why I can't spell skewed. I'm just having issues. So that's negatively skewed. <clears throat> so whenever that tail goes to the left, that's negatively skewed. And you can think of negative numbers on the number line. They're on the left. And the positive numbers are to the right of zero. So you think of that way. And then symmetric is they will look bell-shaped. So that's our bell-shaped. So ours is positively skewed. So that would be the choice that we would pick for uh, this one. On some of these problems, for this question D, they don't ask if it's positively skewed or negatively skewed or um, symmetric. They ask a question about the mean. So let me pull up another picture and show you how we would answer that. So I've downloaded an image from our ebook, um, and it's from figure 3.5, and it shows the different distribution shapes. 
So the first one is positively skewed because the tail is toward the right and the mean tends to follow that skewness. So you can see that the mean is further to the right and anytime something's further to the right, for example, let's take a look at two and seven. Seven is further to the right, so that means seven, when well, it doesn't mean that, but seven is bigger than two, so further to the right means it's gonna be bigger. So the mean's gonna be bigger when the data's positively skewed. It's gonna be bigger than the median. If it's symmetric, the median and the median are equal to one another. They're right in the middle. If it's negatively skewed, again, that mean tends, tends to lean toward that skewness. And so you can see I've drawn that box with the mean uh, and median, and then I show that the uh, data is negatively skewed, or the arrow's pointing to the left, and the mean is going to follow that skewness. So when it's negatively skewed, the mean is on the left. And so when you're on the left, like in the case with two, is to the left of seven on a number line, therefore two is smaller. So the mean will be smaller when it's negatively skewed. So I always tell students, rather than trying to memorize all of that, just draw a picture of the bell-shaped curve or the negatively skewed or positively skewed and just know that the mean follows that tail. So if the mean follows that tail, in one case, the mean will be on the left. And the first case here where it's positively skewed, the mean will be on the right. So I hope this video on um, mean, median, mode comparisons was helpful for you.